Thank you very much, Miriam. Thank you for that. Uh, as uh, Miriam said, my name is Simon Dell. I work for a company called SEMA, if you hadn't already guessed. Um, we're going to talk about advertising today, which is something that um, has a lot of, uh, people have a lot of opinions about, some people are scared of, some people embrace wholeheartedly. Um, before we get into that, I'm going to introduce our panel today, uh, which consists of Liam Lone Lack, uh, Emily Morning, Forrest, and Peter Cunningham. I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves and tell a little bit of a story about uh, each of them, um, maybe a little two minutes kind of uh, elevator pitch. And so we'll start with uh, Liam from Universal McCann. Thank you, Simon, and good morning. It's, it's great to be here. Um, two minutes. Okay, you going to time me? I love, a good ch- I love a good chat, so he's going to have to cut me off hard. So um, no prizes. I'm English, um, and I grew up um, in London. Um, I actually didn't start my career in advertising. Um, I was actually a corporate lawyer, so I'm intellectually um, property is my is my actual original trade. Um, but I moved out of that into recruiting. Again, fun little career change and learned the value of a good recruiter. Um, and then um, and a lot about sales, which we'll come on to because it's very important in relation to advertising too. And then I fell into advertising, but it was a good fall, like many things that happen in your lives. Sometimes the things that happen by accident and because of fate and destiny are sometimes the best things that could ever happen to you. Um, And I started working um, at a global advertising agency called IPG Group in London, um, and I had a a great time. I ended up working and running the Amazon account for the UK uh, and Europe. So I learned a lot about e-com and the way that that particular business worked. Then I moved to Australia, um, and I had the privilege of running Coles and Target out of our Melbourne office at UM. um, And I learned a lot. Uh, on that account, I uh, learned a lot about fresh food, I uh, learned a lot about down down, um, and some of the conversations that I had uh, were quite bizarre um, were on that account. Um, I never thought I'd ever be talking to um, Lee and the other MasterChef guys and in a room and negotiating sponsorship entitlements, things like that. So very bizarre as a POM coming to see firsthand the experience and the kind of obsession that Australians have around food and renovations in TV. Um, Still not over it, if I'm honest. Uh, Then I moved to Sydney for a short time to work on uh, American Express and Nestle. Uh, And then I moved to uh, Queensland as the executive general manager to run the UM office up here. Um, We have clients such as RACQ, fabulous brand. If you don't have your insurance with them, speak to me after, because you should. Um, And then in addition, we have some global clients like Accenture uh, and some other brilliant um, local Queensland clients too. Um, The only other thing I'd say is um, I think I'm an ad contrarian. I'm pretty grumpy about all forms of advertising, uh, which is a good thing, because one of the things I'll be talking about is objectivity in the way we make decisions around advertising. Because yes, Simon, everyone has an opinion, but there is a science to choosing what is right and how you advertise. Is that two minutes? That was way over two minutes. But we'll, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, well, cut, you we'll just cut your off. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, Emily. Yeah, hi guys, my name is Emily. Um, I'm the head of growth at Reload Media. We're a digital marketing agency um, based here in Brisbane, but we also have offices in the UK and the Philippines. Um, So my journey started probably about 15 years ago. I have worked in some sort of retail or e-commerce or marketing role in the past 15 years. Um, Starting in retail just as a salesperson um, on the floor, moving up to um, Video Pro, which is a Brisbane-based retailer here. Um, eventually made my way to then managing their online retail store. Um, so after that, I moved to the UK, did about two years there as every Australian um, about my age does. Um, worked for an agency over there, so moved from client side to agency side and then just fell in love with the pace and the amount of work you get to do within an agency. Um, so then I came back here and I've been at Reload now for about four and a half years. Um, I am in digital marketing and I'm, I'm the same. I think if I get marketed something that I don't agree with, I do get grumpy, but I'm also an absolute sucker so I will buy things if it's very targeted towards me and yeah my closet is full of clothes from retailers that I'd never heard of before and then I get marketed to on Facebook so I also understand I guess the power of marketing and what role that can actually play in a business's success Um, so in my role now I work with small businesses to internationals Um, I work with um, clients that come to us looking to set their digital marketing strategy I work with our team to then kind of come up with that plan um, and then obviously the team then roll it out. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Thank you. Uh, Pete, uh, now it is just two minutes, Peter. I know this is a long story. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thanks. <Tom. laughs> Peter Cunningham is my name. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a partner in a Brisbane business called Red Suit. We're called Red Suit because we believe we're here to help our clients stand out. And the first thing we say about standing out is to stand for something. So we look for what our clients 
uh, what's authentic about our clients and then try to make that compelling. I started advertising as a lot of people in my era started. I was a university dropout and worked as the office boy in an agency and rose up through the ranks of an agency of four people in Fortitude Valley before going down doing some time in Sydney and then coming back and starting my own agency. That agency at one point grew to 35 people and I've never been more miserable in my life. <laughs> Uh, we were working with big clients and we weren't doing the work we wanted to do. We weren't working with people whose businesses we felt we were making a contribution to. And so we paired that right back to the point now where we're much more of a consultancy-based business, working with clients who we admire and who we feel are making a good contribution to. Awesome. That was good. Thank you. Um, listen, the first question I want to ask these guys, and, and just the, the format of today is, we, I've done quite a few of these. and. What I'm trying to get with these guys is for them to have a sort of conversation amongst themselves with you guys. Um, so I'm going to try and, I'd say I'll try and stay out of it as much as I can, but it never happens. Um, but what I want is for you guys to f sort of feel free to interrupt and add on to what everyone else is saying. The, the first thing I want to make very clear is everyone's perception of the difference between marketing and advertising. Because Emily's kind of mentioned marketing, everyone else has mentioned advertising. Just so everybody's clear, where are your, where's your perception of what's different? I'll start with Pete over there. Okay, so I just had a chap come in to me yesterday saying he wanted to get into advertising. And I said to him, what do you mean by that? Because if you know, you can help me. Because I don't know what advertising <laughs> is anymore. You know, Advertising used to be about reach and frequency and some a handful of media that you could choose and you could work through a process that basically said, this many people, this many times with the message that cuts through will get me a connection with an audience that's important to me. These days, it's a lot harder to do that. And I'm not convinced that anybody who tells you they know all the answers you should trust because it's a moving beast and uh, people who specialize in one particular area or another area are most probably going to be able to give you a, a more authentic and believable answer or definition around what advertising is. Okay. If at a very basic level though, it's to me, it's uh, bringing an audience, a, 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 it's creating a dialogue that leads to outcomes. And somewhere in between those two things are outputs. And more often than not, my experience these days is people focus on the outputs, forget the outcomes, and that's why there's rooms full of people like this. Anyone else want to field that one? Yeah. Uh, I, agree com I agree completely. The, the precision around the term is annoying because people yeah. do use them interchangeably. I think for me, it goes back to basics. We don't need to overcomplicate it. There's the four P's of marketing. There's a seven. There's actually an eight I've seen, but we can get into that active debate another time. But the promotion element of the P's, no matter how many P's you want, is just one part of the broader marketing mix. And the reality, depending on the life stage of your business, is advertising will either have a small or a very large contribution to your revenue. If you're a direct selling brand, like a U Foods or a HelloFresh, advertising may, might make up like 30% of your sales. When I was working on Coles, I can tell you now, it was 1.5% of their overall sales was down to paid advertising. So that meant all of their other revenue was generated by the store presence. That's a form of marketing, your staff physical evidence, bags. They're all forms of touch points, to use a, a buzzword, which are part of the marketing mix. But it's defining what the role of paid advertising is versus that broader marketing mix. So that would be my, my build. Anything to add to that, Emily? No, I just think it's you've hit the nail on the head. The terms are just so interchangeable now and they all kind of work in work together. It's not that you just have advertising as one and marketing as another. Marketing can be digital, it can be traditional, it can be face-to-face, -face, it mm. can be any type of marketing. And I think the advertising element fits into that somewhere. The, the, only, yeah. the only clarification I have is there is always the, the more paid element mm. of advertising. So it's always going to be a bit of a more short-term we can, that's not an academic conversation, but a more pet, a more immediate cost base than some of your longer term marketing investments like your shop front, like mm. the way you brand, for example. I, I'm, I'm going to pick up on something you just said there, Liam, because that, quite frankly, something you said there scares me. 1.5% of all Coles' sales was, was through paid advertising. Yep. 
So I guess my next question to all of you at that point, if that's the case, why bother? Because oh, <laughs> there's, there's, that seems a minute part, part of um, you know, a, a huge brand's mm -hmm. um, business. And if the rest of their sales are driven by store presence, location, word of mouth, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, why go to that, that lens? Sure. So yes, it's scary, but in the scheme of Coles and Woolies, a 0.01% market share gain is cause for Prosecco at Coles because they're in this juggernaut war between each other. So if you can get that 1.5% to work an extra 1% harder on a base of a couple of billion of revenue a year, that is a huge achievement. And a marketing budget of $100 million, which is what it was when I was working on it, the numbers stack up in terms of return on investment. So that's Coles. Of course, when we come to the businesses that you represent, it'll obviously be, be a very different story. And the only other thing I'd say before I hand over to the guys is advertising does have a short-term effect, but conversations that certain clients ask me, and I'm sure you've had them across the years as well, what happens if we turn it off? Mm -hmm. I love that question, because if you turn off the advertising, sure, in the short term, medium term, might not have an impact on the revenue that you care about, the leads that you get, but there will be a latent effect that will build over time and you'll start to see a drop off. Mm. Yeah. Don't yeah, we've had that conversation a few times, especially when we think about doing, I guess, um, more premium media brand kind of um, advertising. They think, oh, we don't need that because really all the revenue is coming from the direct paid advertising where someone is searching and then making an immediate transaction. Then they turn that off and then in a year's time, they're like, why is all of our revenue so down? It's because the brand equity and the brand um, reach that you actually had at that same time in the year before was just gone. Um, it's that hard one because you can't always see the immediate impact, but it, yeah, it's a kind of a latent effect. Is that your experience, Pete? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, there were, when you were talking, Lee, that reminded me of a quote that I saw a long time ago that I use all the time when I'm talking to people, which is, how can I love you if I don't know you? And that, so we, you've got to tell people about yourselves. You know, I can't love you if I don't know you. And, you. and just going back to that previous question about advertising, we were called Red Suit Advertising. We're now called Red Suit. And we have a little byline that is brands, behaviours and bottom lines because that's what advertising at the end of the day usually tries to impact on. It tries to build a brand. More often than not, it tries to drive certain behaviours and ultimately is responsible for contributing to a bottom line. So I think we're starting to, as an industry, because of the disruption that's happened over the years, we're starting to understand our roles better and it's, it's leading to more meaningful conversations with clients who have needs either in that brand, behavioural or bottom line space. Emily, when someone comes from new client prospect, sits down with you mm. um, and asks you the, the sort of famous question that all new clients and prospects ask agencies, how much should we be spending? Mm -hmm. What do you what do you say? Look, at the end of the day, like every they always come to us and they say, well, what are your other clients spending? But at the end of the day, every single business is its own little ecosystem. You can only really spend what you are comfortable spending. Um, I always kind of go back to, well, what are you willing to pay for a new client? Um, look at your existing revenue. How much is, um, I guess, organic? All of these other kind of channels actually driving from a revenue perspective. Um, what's kind of the market share that you have there at the moment? Um, and then how competitive is that market? So if you are going up against a juggernaut that is going to, that is willing to spend hundreds of dollars for a new client, but you know that realistically you can only really spend 20, then we need to be a bit more crafty about how we actually go about advertising. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, we always just go back to, I guess, yeah, how much you're currently making and then what you're willing to actually pay for a new client. Liam, you must have had a few people standing in front of you that don't know, want to spend money, but don't know how much they should be spending. Where, like does, it, where does the conversation go? It's like you in the meeting I had yesterday. Yes, <laughs> um, I agree. It, it, it's a conversation about what do you want to achieve? The, the, the problem is clients get a bit emotional around that because sometimes they actually don't know. So they've got a poor brief or they've just been lumped with a target from a stakeholder and gone, there's your marketing budget. So I think for me, it comes back to, is there a proper budgeting process? in the client business and trying to add value at that stage before we get some half-baked, unachievable budget and, and a kind of related objective. Um, but most clients use percentage of revenue, percentage of 
new customer acquisition cost, percentage of profitability, um, to, to then kind of work backwards to what the marketing budget is. So it's getting upstream, helping clients budget better, use data points to help tell their business, but before they get issued the budget, what is gonna be realistic. Because otherwise you get in this awful kind of, can you give me a good, better, best budget approach? And this, this scenario planning, which is not helpful. Mm. We should, it should be quite a simple conversation around objective cost of growth, because that's what advertising is about, coming to really say it's cost of growth, bottom line, and there are various tools you can use around that. How do you approach that conversation, Pete, when they don't know how much they should be spending? I ask them what they want to spend their money on. Uh, and what I mean by that is it can, we'll, we'll have people come and say, I want to do this digital campaign, or I want to do this social media, or I want to, and I say, what are you going to put in it? What are you going to say? And they say, oh, well, we, you know, the things that we've always done. And I say, don't come to me wanting to do a hump day post because that's not what we're here for. You know, what, what I say is the first thing you've got to do is you've got to understand your brand. You've got to be able to articulate the brand. Are you willing to spend money on that? Because if you're not willing to spend money on that, a lot of what you spend in the space where Liam and Emily operate uh, is going to be wasted. So I just try to ask questions, get an understanding and help clients work out where they want to spend the money. There's a lot of people that end up saying, ah, oh, thanks, no, you, you know what we wanted. We wanted a digital agency. And then they go to the digital agency. And the digital agency asks them the same questions that I asked them, but because they're a digital <laughs> agency, there's a, there's a, a more open-minded approach to, to uh, answering those questions. But I, I love a client without a budget. You know, we, we've made our built our business and enjoyed ourselves over the years dealing with challenger brands. You know, brands that haven't had a whole lot of money taking on the bigger guys. There's nothing more satisfying than being a giant killer. And that's what I like in an agency, what, what I like in a client. And the good thing about that is then there's usually a need and where there's a need, there's a preparedness to spend some money. And so that's what I look for. And then discussions about what that cost come to after that. Mm. Do, do you think there's a, a role for marketing for, for you guys, for advertising, to be getting a bit more involved in um, the financial side of things. I know from, you know, as soon as I start pulling the thread about how much money do you want to spend or what's your budget, next thing you know, I'm looking at their zero and P&L and things like that and trying to determine, do, do you think, you know, we should be sort of, you know, looking at that in more detail, Lynn? It's, it's critical. Yeah. The first thing I ask any client is how do you measure the, how do you measure the incremental effect that advertising has on your business. Then it becomes very clear to me, <clears throat> some aggressive nodding in the front, um, <laughs> it becomes very clear to me what type of client I'm dealing with, if it's fluff, or if they go, yes, based off this internal modeling technique or this uh, attribution technique, we've estimated it's between $2 and $3, depending on season now, they go, great, we've got some things to work with, or it's a very different conversation. Advertising is just another form of business investment. The problem is we use the language of cost, spend, and we do not measure it properly. Mm. And so if we're gonna help clients grow, which is ultimately why we're all employed, we have to speak the language of the CFO. Mm. Because more than ever, that especially post COVID, but even before COVID, right? That is the only way we're gonna help clients succeed and grow. So it's, it, it's now table stakes would be my response. Mm. Emily, how do, you, how do you know that you're getting a return on what you're doing? What's the best? What's the best way that you guys have, have in measuring? Yeah, so I guess there's two types of relationships that we generally have with clients, and the best relationship is the one where we're really integrated into their actual business. So there's obviously the immediate, um, I guess, leading indicators that we can look at, and especially if it's an e-commerce business or you can actually trade and purchase online. Um, the immediate indicators that we can see from that are obviously your revenue, um, but then there's all the leading indicators that happen before that. Um, what we generally try and do is actually then work with the clients either on a monthly or a quarterly basis and we say, well, how does that actually impacted your overall business? So if they do um, trade deals where they have direct transactions happening <laughs> offline. <laughs> the following times will be a test of the final evaluation <laughs> system. Good. Only, please disregard all sounders. Please stand by for the following times will be a test of the test only. Now action is required. Right. Do I Convenient? wait? Convenient. <laughs> there we go. Emergency. <laughs> oh. Okay, 
So where was I? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we have generally like quarterly business reviews with our clients where we look at the marketing impact, but then we also work with their internal teams, as Liam mentioned, to actually understand the impact that it's had on bottom line. Um, a lot of the clients we work with have longer buying cycles as well. So it's not just that immediate quick fix that you get from a paid marketing campaign that they then buy online. Um, you actually need to look at a longer period, especially if that purchase or, or length of that sales cycle is you know months or even years. Um, so yeah, that's generally how we would work. Pete, yourself, what about, uh, how do you guys know that that's, you're getting a return, that what, what you're doing is success? Uh, your clients are pretty quick to tell you, mm. <laughs> I've found. And you know, the, the disciplines that the guys here have been talking about, they, you know, they are disciplines that you know, I think every marketing organisation would encourage their clients to enter into with them. I think at the end of the day, though, you've got to know the right questions to ask because it's very easy. You know, I once had a client who was only interested, and this was a government client, so you can understand that, was only interested in likes. You know, that's all they were interested in. You know, so, so what do you want to measure? What do you want to use? Your, how are you going to use your data? Because there's so much data out there. And there's a, there's a great guy who was, uh, he, was, um, he was a doctor and he was in community development around the planet, worked with United Nations, worked with a lot of governments. Guy named Hans Rosling, and he said, "You can't understand the world without data, but you can't understand the world with data alone." And that's where I think people who understand brands and messaging and behaviours have got a contribution to make to the data. And so I try to get a bit of clarity around how people are using their data and how we can make a contribution. The, cool. the other thing I'd add is. Um, Obviously, we're all on the same page when it comes to actually quantifying the effect, having the internal business mm. conversation with the client. But there's a few hard lessons I've learned about internal marketing and the importance of marketing to other stakeholders in the client business about what you're doing in market and why it's so great. So any franchise-based business, I've worked on Specsavers A and Z for three years, and I learned painfully mm. how important it was to get buy-in and show visibly what it was doing to drive their presence, fame, and, and, and local business, I suppose, mm. rather than just the overall contribution to the wider business. And that is something that, yeah, is a painful lesson that I've learned over the years. Too. Liam, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. We're, we're more and more seeing the, the work that we do with our clients. A lot of it is targeting their internal audiences. Yeah. Why is that so important? Uh, what happens if you don't do that? Okay, well, because I think because of the fragmented nature of the marketplace these days, you've got to, uh, you've got to, make the most of the opportunities to build advocacy where you can. And your closest set of advocates or saboteurs are your staff. So how many times over the years have you been exposed to somebody who is in some sort of marketing related role or works in an organization, does a bit of marketing and say, yeah, we're doing that, but I don't really like that ad. Or, you know, those guys have done that again. We all sit, we all think it's horrible. You know, <laughs> what's, what's the point, mm. you know? The, the, the advocacy has got to come from your people and then their people and then their networks. So it's got to start internally. You know, the, it takes me back to a great, we were doing some persuasive argument workshops with a client in Melbourne recently. And one of the uh, cards that I asked one of the people to talk about was uh, welcome newbie. And it was a new person comes into the organisation. What are the three things that you will tell that person about the organization to to give them an understanding of the organization and the girl who was presenting on that she gave a great present presentation she started by going back to 1962 when john f kennedy was it was at the start of america's real push to get to the moon and he went to nasa he saw a janitor there and he said to the janitor what do you do and he said i'm here to put man on the moon is the president that's what you want from your people and that's why internal audiences are where you've got to start. Everyone's got to be on the same page. So what's you in your organizations, the people who do all the things that are behind the scenes, what would what's their man on the moon purpose? Mm. And if you don't know that, you're most probably, um, you know, there's, there's work to do within your, uh, your own understanding of your brand before you can expect mm. people a long way from the center of your business to understand and love you. Mm. Okay. I had the same thing with a printer years and years ago, and I said to him, he was complaining about his sales guy wasn't getting any, wasn't getting the sales that he wanted, wasn't getting the, um, 
you know, the orders and the new customers and all those kind of things. And I'd asked him, what are the three things that, you know, stand out about your brand? What should your salesperson be talking about? And he, he, could, he got one. And that's the, that was the owner yeah. of the business. And, and my yeah. point was, if you can't do it, how the hell do you yeah. expect these people to be talking about your brand yeah. out there in the marketplace? How does that translate to the smaller businesses? So there, there, there might be some smaller businesses in the room that might have four or five employees or that kind of thing. Is, is it just as important for, for, you know, to bring them along? How involved do you get them, Liam? It, critical. It's, it, it's just as important. I think size is, is, is irrelevant on that scale. I think it's a lot harder in a, obviously, a big organization. So in some instances, it's, it's easier. Because I'll take the point, and I agree with you completely, Peter, you need to get your internal stakeholders galvanized, not only because probably one of them is paying for it, which is quite helpful, where the, where's the budget coming from? And secondly, it comes down to an effectiveness argument. Advertising is paid, but we talk about own channels, own channels, and shared channels. And one of your best owned assets is your people. Mm. Seeing advertising out there, feeling a bit of fame and pride in what they do, will have a knock-on effect to their productivity and output, for sure. Mm. It's another conversation about human resources, but I've seen it happen many times in medium organizations, large organizations, and, and, and small organizations. Um, and if they've got that buy-in, it will multiply the, 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 the outcome of the campaign just mm. by that very nature. Yeah, I think as well, something I've experienced speaking to small business owners is that you guys wear a lot of hats. So having more people in the organization who can pick up some of those pieces who you can completely trust with your brand, um, just kind of relieves some of the pressure off you as well. And it also then gives them, you know, they then want to see this brand grow as much as you do because they're along for the journey. Um, I think getting them in the, into those different roles, like they'll identify opportunities and they'll be the, the biggest advocates for your brand. Emily, we've, you've got a client, you've, you know, you understand them, you've um, got a clear budget, we, you know what you're trying to achieve. And I know this question is really dependent on their industry and their target market, but what are, what are the best channels? And perhaps better still, how do you determine which channels mm. people should be advertising in? Yeah, so um, we generally look at um, like an overall funnel. So you have obviously top of funnel campaigns, it's all about awareness, middle of funnel is consideration. So if they've, your brand is kind of in their, in their thoughts, like how can you then get in front of them? And then there's the conversion. So you've got three different stages of your funnel, but you really have to make sure that you're advertising to the right person at those different stages with the right content. <laughs> yep, um, I see some funny nods over there. Um, so really it's about, I guess, understanding who your customer is, um, where they actually go for that different kind of pieces of information and then finding the right channel. Um, I think the biggest thing though, is you can't start at the conversion stage if you haven't topped up the funnel. So you need to make sure you do actually have leads coming in whether it's you know getting in front of the right people, getting people just engaging with your brand or engaging with different advertising, and then kind of pushing them through the funnel. Um, if you're a niche brand and niche product, um, you actually need to create some demand. You can't just go start capturing. Um, so there's a few different stages, and obviously there's a plethora of different types of advertising methods and tactics and channels that you can use. But we generally always start with the funnel and your audience. I have a, a slightly different, I agree, but I do have a slightly Please. different approach yep. um, for, for small business, which I'm conscious is probably in the room. So there's two facts. Advertising is expensive. And over the last six years, customer acquisition costs in across all industries, across the world, gone up by about 50, 60%. So acquiring new customers is so hard. If you're a small business, you already will have, I assume, depending on your business, some type of first party data capture. If you're just starting to advertise, you need to use a funnel approach, agree. But if it's a short-term campaign, I'm sure it's all more about short-term if you're just starting to get your kind of hands wet in, in, in the advertising world, think about what customers haven't bought from you yet or whether there is an opportunity to increase average order value or things like that. And then the natural channels which come off the back of it, social, SEM, anything in, in, in the digital landscape. It, when you, the further you get up the funnel, it's going to get more expensive. Mm. So if you want short-term results, just think about your first-party data strategy. People who've visited the site, you have some form of personally identifiable information, but they haven't bought from you. That is your high-value audience in the short term. If you can convert them, you nurture it with a loyalty program. And a loyalty program is not just an, a, a, an existing retention tool. It is also an acquisition driver, leveraging word of mouth. 
that would be a great starting point for mm -hmm. those in the room. Yeah. Um, not to, to kind of, it's not a disagree, but like I a build as a... I actually <laughs> want to add to okay, yours great. as well. Great. So um, there was an iOS 14 update that literally rolled out yesterday, um, which yeah. meant that you can no longer just do um, very specific advertising to people within Facebook if they have this iOS 14 um, update on their phone. Um, so that's now limiting how you can actually advertise across Facebook um, just using pixel data. Um, the second one is there's Death of the Cookie, which is coming out um, in the next couple of years across Chrome. It's already on Safari. Um, essentially means you, you can no longer just track people like we normally have been, unless you're using a more premium media um, tool. Um, because of that, first party data is actually going to be so much more important than it has ever been before. Um, so yeah, using your existing email database and first party data, but then also actually creating a strategy to start capturing it. It's not something that you would need to pay for. It's literally putting an email subscription or creating content that people actually want to engage and read with. Um, having that on your website and starting to capture that information, you could literally start doing that tomorrow and that's going to benefit you in a year's time. Pete, my experience with Red Suit um, is perhaps what I would describe more as a traditional uh, agency, traditional approach. Um, and by that, I mean um, the above the line type advertising. Um, and perhaps maybe before you answer this question, you could explain to people what the difference between above the line and below the line is, because that's quite an antiquated term, but a lot of people still still use it, don't they, in, in, out there? Yes. So my, my question was, in, in your sort of, in your experience, in your sort of field where you operate, what are the best channels that, that, that you see for clients? Well, it's really interesting, Simon. We, we have a number of clients who operate in regional markets. And so in those regional markets, you know, a television campaign still does great work for people. You know, yes. Some of those traditional above the line things do uh, still work very effectively in markets that are, I guess, um, a little bit more close knit and uh, have, um, don't have the options that they might consider because of um, internet access or um, broadband width or whatever the other issues they may experience are. So they, they, they operate in a more traditional space. I guess what I would say around channels is don't be afraid to zig while everyone else is zagging. You know, so um, I still haven't worked out why more agencies and marketers aren't going back to uh, snail mail as an opportunity to connect with their customers, mm -hmm. given how little snail mail we all get. Why are we all competing in the information superhighway, and wow, 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 on our computer screens, when there's this big, beautiful desk with nothing on it except you know, a photo of the husband and kids or whatever it is, it can stay around, it can be discussed. We've had some great success with that in recent times with niche clients, just getting to them where I, I hand wrote a note to a fella and said, uh, when you, uh, over the next couple of weeks, I'll give you a call if what I've said makes sense, maybe we can catch up for coffee. He called me the next day. I didn't even expect a call from him. He was a senior guy in an organization. But the value of a handwritten letter really obviously connected with him. And so I'd say don't be afraid to zig while everyone else is zagging. There's, these guys are demonstrating for you that there is a wealth of knowledge and opportunity in being able to identify and track your target audience via digital and, and data-based means. But that's not the only world that people live in. And being able to be present in some of their other worlds is, opens a whole lot of doors of opportunity, I'd suggest. Agreed. Mm. It, it's funny you should say that. I had a client uh, from mentoring in here, and he makes, um, he's invented this external cladding to go on the outside of buildings that's fireproof, obviously very poignant at the moment. He was on Channel 7 the other day, the other day in a, one of those reports. And he's got basically three, three potential clients, three potential distributors in, in Australia. And he said, how do I get through to them? And I said to him, I said, and there was a big piece of the cladding, like this giant piece of aluminium in the room at the time. I said, can we cut that up into A4 pieces? And he went, absolutely. I said, let's send it to everybody. 
I mean, nobody's going to be expecting a giant, you know, a, yeah. a giant piece of aluminium cladding coming through to them in the in the post. <laughs> I said we could run ads, we could run Facebook ads, we could do a LinkedIn campaign, do all these things, but you are guaranteed to cut through yeah. if we send them a giant piece of aluminium cladding in the yeah. post yeah. with a note and a brochure and a letter yeah. and an invitation to chat. Yeah. So I, I totally agree. I think you know, direct mail is the is, is the way. We we are doing it. Okay, yes. good. it was the conversation <laughs> happened on Tuesday, so we are um, we we are about to get boxes and all those kind of things. So yeah, there's only going to be 12 of them going out, but yeah. So you need gonna, one. Yeah, absolutely, only needs, only needs one to cut through, so. Can I just add something yeah. to that as well? So Google um, did this study and obviously we know now that the path to someone purchasing is no longer linear. It used to be someone would get a you know brochure in their mail, it would be for the, the latest catalog of dresses at whatever shop, and then they would see the one they liked, they would go into store and they would buy it. There's a part now that they're calling the messy middle. So people might become aware of your brand and then they purchase, but there's this whole gray area that happens in the middle that no one actually knows the exact path that they take to then purchase. So I think by having a really you know, deep um, understanding of who that customer is and actually having all of those touch points there so that if they do decide to go here and there and zigzag all over the place, they're still able to get that exact same experience um, with the brand mm. before they purchase. But I, I, I talked about being an ad contrarian and grumpy about all forms of media at the start. Um, and this is where I definitely, um, in, in certain instances, because you're right, regional TV, for example, amazing, absolutely cheap. Oh my God, so cheap. <laughs> um, and if you've got the creative, amazing. So it's not just a digital kind of buffet. Mm. Um, there's, there's lots you should be thinking about in that more traditional or above the line space. Um, and yes, messy middle is a big thing. Mm. But then you look at the behavior of people who get Audi catalogs. I'm one of them. Like, and when I was working on Coles, the MD of Coles at the time, John Durkin, tried to take away the catalog. Do you know how long that lasted? Three weeks. Sales went poof. Wow. Yeah. So, it, <laughs> it, 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 yes, digital is important. But the questions you should be asking are, what is my category? What are the behaviors of consumers mm. in my category? Where is the opportunity? Everyone's spending in every channel. You're never going to get white space, but you can differentiate with creative and then perhaps a media behavior. Like this amazing mm. example for direct mail, mm. aluminum sheet, amazing. Tried and tested channel, you're executing it differently. Mm. That's a rich type of conversation I would suggest you have with yourselves and your teams about. I think the other thing I was going to say is that obviously advertising is very much about the senses and the, the, the five senses and tapping into them. And in you know the case of TV and radio, it's very obvious, it's eyes and ears. But the impact that getting somebody to touch something or feel something, get somebody to smell something and taste something, that has a you know that has a, a massive you know impact as well. And and direct mail is you know is an obvious one where immediately they've got the option to sort of touch something. And that, that, that's a completely different experience to seeing a YouTube video or seeing a billboard. How important are those, it's sort of tapping into all those five senses, Pete? Oh, I think they're incredibly important. Yeah. It, it, there's, there's a guy, uh, Yuval Noah Harari. He, I don't know if you've heard him. He's a biologist and historian. He wrote a great book called Sapiens. It was written some other books since then, but it, he basically said, how did we go from being a timid jungle dwelling ape to the dominant species on the planet? And he pretty much builds a very compelling argument that says it's our imaginations. It's, you, you can negotiate with a monkey all day to get that banana off them by promising them eternal life or um, you know, a, a heaven or all the riches of the planet. It's not going to give it to you. And yet we agree on all sorts of things based on our imaginations. We agree on currencies, we agree on borders, we agree on all sorts of things. So how do you get into somebody's imagination? Well, if you're able to get, say, and we're talking a lot about direct mail here, but that's the question that uh, Simon asked. If you're able to get something onto somebody's desk, what a great opportunity to tap their imagination. You know, that I can guarantee you're not tapping a whole lot of imaginations the further you get into the funnel. The, the imagination stuff happens at the top of the funnel or it happens on a desk or it happens in the car on the way home when you hear a radio ad. It happens when people are living their lives. So being imaginative and the opportunities that 
um, you know, as soon as you start to tap into somebody's imagination, that that is, how do we want them to feel about this? What do we want them? What does having this in their hands do for them? I think is it's a no-brainer, and it's something that we've lost sight of because, frankly, there are a lot of interests, and there is a lot of evidence to suggest that people should be invested in that space. But people have gone digital nuts. You know, they've gone digital nuts, and there are so many. You know, I remember. One of the advantages of being around a long time is I remember when uh, video recorders came in, everyone said, oh, it's going to be the death of cinemas. Then all of a sudden, pay TV came in, oh, that's going to be the death of cinemas and live sport. Then streaming came in. Everyone keeps on thinking it's going to be the death of traditional things, but you can't, you, you can't hold hands and go to watch a video together. You can't eat popcorn in a dark room with other people like you, as you can at a cinema, there's always going to be opportunities for people's imaginations to be triggered. You just have to be you know, willing to be present in those places. Cinema advertising, great place to get to people. Agreed. A bit harder this last year, but great place to get to people traditionally. Um, my last question for today, um, which I know is one that Pete's um, looking forward to answering, I want to talk about content because... Um, Channels, budget, all those kind of things. If if you're not if you're not sending through the right content, if you're not creating the right content, the right messaging, the right advertising, mm -hmm. it, it could all be for nothing. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to leave Pete to last on this one because it could it could go on down there. Um, I want to get let, let him have a free run of it. So, so um, I'll start with Liam from the content perspective. Sure. The big question is. These guys have decided to do some advertising. Great. How do they stand out? Great. So um, if we're going to create a pie chart, who, do, who doesn't love a pie chart as well? Really simple. <laughs> when you look at um, the effectiveness of all types of advertising campaigns, certainly from the data that I've seen, only about 35% of a positive effectiveness, so sales growth, revenue growth, whatever you want, when it's all rolled up, comes from channel selection, targeting, etc. The remainder is all the content or the creative message. So it, it does sometimes surprise me when, if you think about that, the energy effort that's spent on that 35% and the kind of lackluster job that's done on the remainder. Um, and when it comes to that, and Pete mentioned some great things earlier about, you know, what, what does your brand actually stand for? Great. Why should anyone care? How is the best way to actually convey that at all before we even engage a channel conversation? I think so many times I see clients and agencies rush to talk about channels. Let's talk about the emotive trigger. Even if you're selling cladding, fire cladding, if I may use that example, there's a functional story, there's a rational story, but people don't buy even for a house, they do not buy on functional and rational proof points. They buy based off their heart, their emotion. You then justify using your rational brain what you actually want to do. So the creative development process and the content you create or the creative you put into the channels, I think needs a lot more attention. And the simplest, simplest way I put it is, who are you speaking to? What do you want them to think, feel, and do, just a really simple framework, but actually think, feel, and do. It's pretty hard to just nail down to one sentence. What do you want your aspiring young professionals in the CBD, if you're targeting them, to think about your brand, to feel about your brand, and actually what action do you wish them to take? And what are the, what are the emotive triggers around that? That is how I would talk about okay. content through that lens um, as a process, more than like you should do this type of ad in that channel, this type of ad in that channel. Mm. Okay. I 100% agree with everything you've just said. <laughs> um, so we do a thing um, with our clients where we talk about motivation-led creative. Um, so you might have a business and say you're selling soda. Um, you might just go with a single message to all these people saying, I love soda, I love soda. That's all you're going for. There's a whole wide reach that you're missing out on when you're tapping into different people's motivators. So whether it's the flavors or it's all organic 
um, actually tapping into their motivators um, and then what actually motivates them at different stages of the funnel. Um, it is quite hard, I think, when you are thinking about it just in a digital lens because if it's soda, they can't taste it. Um, they obviously don't have that um, in-person experience. So actually tapping into what would motivate them to actually purchase your product over another um, and then pulling out key messages that you can then hit to that motivation. Um, and then obviously when you're thinking about different stages of the funnel, like what actually motivates them to move down the different stages of the funnel. Right then, Pete. <laughs> Content. <laughs> don't know why you're picking on me. <laughs> so, how, how, do, how, do we, how do people stand out? Okay, what I would say to uh, those comments that you've just heard, they are very uh, uh, reflective of um, best practice in our business. You know, um, who are we talking to? Where are in their minds? What's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the key message? What's the support? What's the personality? What I see, because so many people take responsibility for their own messaging now, you know, the, the person who is the graphic artist is now also the social media person is also the, the this and the that in the organisations. What I see is people saying, this is what we think people need, so this is what we're going to say. And so before you know it, everyone's saying the same thing. Nobody's standing out and everyone's you know, at sessions like this. So we go back a step and we say, you've got to think about your business and why your people are there and then go out from there. So we say, what's authentic about your business? And then how do you make that compelling? Not what does the consumer want? Sure, you can get to what the consumer, but you know, Coles and Woolworths, the consumers want the same things in a lot of days. You know, I, I still I want my bread, I want my milk. You know how they get their business? They do all this marketing, but then $7.99 chicken breasts, you know, they'll have a huge war about that. They'll, they'll have $1 milk. You know, so all the marketing in the world comes down to, oh, that's not working, let's do $1 milk or $7.99 chickens. So, and then people come and say, uh, I, I, I'll get onto that subject if we get to it. Uh, I was going to start talking about Amazon there and, and some of the complaints people have about Amazon, but I don't see anything that Amazon that does that Woolworths and Coles don't already do. You know, Woolworths and Coles already attract buyers into their marketplace, see what's selling well, then make their own home brands. They've been doing it for years and we don't all say, oh, you're the bad guys, like people are saying about Amazon. Anyway, that's another thing. That's that's for another workshop. So. <laughs> so authentic. What do we do about authentic? The first thing we do is we go in and we talk to our clients' people and we say, why are you working here? Why will you still be here in five years' time? And talk all about them. And then we ask our clients, can we talk to their suppliers? Why do you deal with these guys? Why would you still be dealing with them five years' time? Why don't you deal with someone else? Then we ask the other people in their network. So we ask all the people closest to them why they're all in this together, why they'd still be here in five years' time. Usually there's some gems there. So then you've got an opportunity to deliver some authentic content that you can own that other people can get a better understanding about you of. Otherwise, you're in with everybody else saying, yeah, we've got this great tasting thing and nobody knows any more about you. The best brands are the ones that are able to take what's authentic about their offering and make it compelling in the marketplace. And if that's not good enough, maybe they shouldn't be there, yeah. is the way I look at it. I'm just going to add to that. My business partner often repeats a saying to me all the time. He said, people don't necessarily, people don't buy the cheapest product. They buy the product they understand the quickest. Um, so when they're, you know, sitting in Coles and Woolworths and they've got that decision fatigue where there's, you know, a dozen sources in front of them, they're going to buy which one they understand the quickest. Yep. And I don't know whether that kind of fits into what you guys are saying there. but Well, it does. There's another quote that's very similar to that, which is first to mind is better than a better product. You know? Yeah. And that's why people advertise and market because first to mind, more often than not, is better than a better product unless you're able to distinguish your better product in, you know, through the means we've been talking mm. about today. Mm. Um, any final comments around content from, from you guys? Um, I think the, I think just leaning onto your point is that before you go about creating any content, you really have to understand yeah, what your brand stands for so that everything you then do is kind of held up by your overall vision and mission of the business. 
And then what are the key pillars that you want to get across in everything that you do? And then what are the support points that you can then pull on, whether that's case studies, whether it's client testimonials, whether it's testimonials from the people within your organization to support that point. You really need to have like a brand messaging house that you can then always go back to and say, well, does this align to how we want to be perceived in market as a business? And then everything else you could do can kind of support that. The only, the only final thought on, on content or creative I have, there's two small pointers. Please just make sure there's a distinction between things that you want to return in the short term and things you want to return in the long term. Mm -hmm. If you have a mixed message, it's going to be chaos and you're going to have a lot of trouble when you get to channel selection. Mm -hmm. um, and the second point, everything you do in marketing, not just advertising, but marketing, you should be addressing human pain. What, what, even if you sell toilet paper, even if you sell cladding, come up for example, what is the need, the human need that you are trying to solve? We're still selling to humans. Mm. But you do get carried away with the digital and the kind of the people want the best thing for the lowest price, yeah. But at the same time, people want shortcuts. People want to actually have a quick decision because they're so tired of making decisions. Mm. And if you can create those trust signals, and you can demonstrate your satisfying functional need and there's an emotive hook to it too, that's how to create the best content in my point of view. I'm gonna ask one more question. I'm probably gonna ask two more questions and hopefully get really short answers on these just so that we can then throw, out, throw this open to the audience. Um, something that's very uh, timely at the moment. I want, I, I want your opinion in a sentence on the milkshake advert. Um, <laughs> and my question is, I should, um, how, how, do they get, how do they get it so wrong or did they get it wrong? So disclaimer, the federal government is a client of my business. Right, okay. So maybe um, you don't want to so, answer this um, one. But... And yeah, so we, 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 buy that, we bought that campaign for okay, So yeah, right. so um, I probably can't comment directly. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Emily, Milkshake Advert. I don't know the Milkshake Advert. Okay. Right. Yeah, so Have I you can't seen comment either. I haven't seen it. I've seen the commentary on it. Yes. Uh, and I... Because I haven't seen it, I don't think I can. Okay. Any so none of us can. Fair enough. Fair but enough. isn't it just running in Victoria at the moment? So I think it's been quite prevalent on the uh, on the uh, internet mm. and things like that. Yeah. But, uh, just, just for everyone's to benefit, the Milkshake yeah. advert is the federal uh, federal yeah. government's advert about teaching kids about consent uh, mm. using milkshakes as a anyway. Um, if you get a chance, go to Google, type in milkshake okay. advert, and you'll understand. Yeah. Okay. It, it was pulled quite quickly. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, the last question. Small businesses, small to medium sized businesses, um, there is no silver bullet, there is no instant you know, fix. But the other hand, tactically, what's something these guys should be doing? You know, if they want to say, yeah, do you know what? I want to grow my business. I want, I want to advertise. What's one maybe tactical thing that they should be going out there today or tomorrow and thinking about doing? Liam? Might sound weird coming from um, the GM of an advertising agency, but get your first party data in order. Yeah. Invest in the technology to do it now because that is the future of many forms of advertising, not all, but please do that now. Get your customer architecture right. It will pay dividends. And if you're at that stage in your business where you're starting out or in your like your growth phase, that's the best money you can probably spend in the short term. And then you can have some interesting advertising conversations in the near future. Mm. Okay, Emily? Yeah, I would actually piggyback onto that and say first party data is essential. Um, if you do that and you have a really good email platform or CRM that you're going to be using to actually store that data and then be able to use it, um, creating campaigns that are built around building that first party data, um, whether that's across social advertising, um, where you actually do inform, so in platform form submissions, where you're actually actively capturing people's email um, database. Um, I'd say that would be your next step, but email platform first, then advertising campaigns to build that. Pete, first step out there for them. Okay, so if this is tactical, I'd say investigate opportunities to zig while everyone else is zagging or expecting you to zag. See, see where else you can show up in people, your customers' lives rather than where you think you're expected to show up. And if there's one other thing that you can do, so what I would say is just look at whatever process that you're currently undertaking because there's a great... Uh, uh, a chap who was credited with being the Westerner most influential in the Japanese miracle 
post-World War II, a guy named W. Edwards Lemming. He, he said, um, if you can't articulate your process, you don't know what you're doing. So just have a look at your process and see, do we just do this because we think it's right? Oh, we've got a proper process and then interrogate that. There's lots of things you can be doing to make money and save money without spending anything with any of the people on this um, platform here. As a matter of fact, he also says uh, defects cost a lot of money. Somebody at some point has been paid to create a defect. So if your stuff isn't working right now, you're either paying yourselves or someone else within your business to create defects. Um, I'm going to add my point to this is that from a tactical perspective, my one thing I say to clients is collect email addresses. I don't think I've seen a business, I don't think any business with a large database of emails of customers and prospects can fail. I, I, you know, I know that sounds a bit of a bold statement. I think the more emails you have of prospects and customers, the better chance you have of success in the long run. So yeah. everything in my mind, from an advertising perspective, from a marketing perspective, should be go the goal number one should be collect an email address of somebody that's interested in your product. Um, I've seen some fantastic businesses that run very lean with 50,000, 60,000 people on a database, and they know that the moment they send an e-newsletter out, they'll make sales like that. And that's just the most cost effective for me in terms of advertising and marketing. But you do need to do other advertising and marketing to drive everyone to collect those emails. So look, um, I'll throw that open to the, to, the, um, to, the, to the audience now. If there's any questions, just um, raise your hand and we'll get to them. If there isn't, don't worry. And we will all hang around for five, 10 minutes and you can ask us one-to-one -one afterwards. But is there anybody that wants to? Okay, no, with that in mind, um, I'd just like to thank uh, Liam. Oh, sorry, yes, go for it. Go for it. First of all, thank you very much to all of you. It was a fascinating uh, discussion and uh, really, really interesting. So uh, thank you for giving your time today. Right. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not a small business person. I actually work for a very large organisation that own shopping centres across Australia. But we work with a lot of small businesses who do pop-ups in our, our centres, casual laundry store, etc. Mm -hmm. And they're some of the most hard-working, genuine people but they're very, very time poor uh, and they're not necessarily marketing or advertising experts. So my question is, um, how important is it for a small business person to invest in relationships and professional advice? Um, a lot of them will say, we have no spare capital, you know, we can't invest in, in marketing, but if there is an opportunity to do so, um, there's a lot of people out there that are offering, throwing a lot of advice to them. It, it, it is a very noisy, noisy place. So how is it good? How important is it to make sure that you partner with the right people to give you the right advice so that the money you do invest, you get the best return and the best outcome? Great question. Mm. Um, I think it, it's like anything. Uh, I'll give you an example from my personal life. I'm considering investing in, in a property coach um, because I want investment properties. It's, but it's also about, there's a time poor element, but it's also about what brief do you actually want to give them? And I think many small businesses, they don't necessarily know what the core problem they're trying to solve is. If they're a small business owner, they're clearly bringing in sales, but then ha it's a conversation about growth and what role advertising particularly plays in that. So if they, have, they, can, if they can form a brief, and they can really articulate the challenge they want advertising to solve, they should engage someone for a project, something like Touch to go, these are the types of things you'd consider you can do, like an audit on things you could do. But from that moment, there's a conversation about execution, like do we have capacity to do it? And there are various nimble output-based models that are, that are now around. I think, I speak for my business, but I'm sure the same for the ones on stage. Um, it's not, the days are gone of, you know, long fees and lot over months and months, you know, there's a lot more output based kind of little interventions and you come away and, and you and you revisit it. Mm. So that would be my advice. If they form can form a good brief, they can articulate that. The day they spend doing that will pay dividends when they do then subsequently wish to, to get some strategic help. But I don't think they should outsource their brain because I see many clients do that and they're not doing that thinking up front. Mm. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, so um, I guess this is just a way that we work as a business, um, but it's 
it's free to just have a conversation with someone, um, even just calling up an agency just to talk about what their options are, um, I think is a really good place to start. Um, at the end of the day, they'll be given free advice on what they could potentially do. Obviously, um, it would always be within their budget if they don't have a budget. We just give them free advice anyway of things that they could potentially try. Um, I think it's a really good point that Liam made. If you actually have a brief and a plan, um, and we've worked with businesses before that don't have the budget to engage with an agency full time, uh, we actually just help them come up with, well, what do the next three months need to look like? And then they actually do it internally or they use um, like an intern, um, someone that wants to get some work experience working across those platforms. Um, there are definitely different ways and options that they could go about it. Pete, do you want to add on stuff? Uh, yeah, that's a really interesting question because one of the reasons they're in a big shopping centre like yours is because they're hoping that the foot traffic in that shopping centre will be enough to sustain their business. So I guess the, the conversation then has to be, well, what are they doing with the foot traffic that's in the shopping centre and how can they maximise that? That would be where I'd start because... They're not paying the rents they're paying in a shopping centre to not make the most of the people that are in that shopping centre. So that's mm -hmm. where I'd start. And then um, if that proves successful, that might give them the confidence to try and bring more people from outside the shopping centre into that shopping centre. But that's where I'd start is how can they make the most of what's in that centre and work with you guys to do a better job mm -hmm. of it because that's why they're there, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, that's, that's a really, really good point. Uh, anyone, small business people, should be leveraging their expertise and mm. knowledge and their advice and saying, come invest in me here at this place that we're in. Um, it's a relationship. I, you know, I, I want your expertise taps into your self-interest as well because you don't want to be looking for new retailers when they go belly up. So mm -hmm. the there is already an opportunity for some collaboration that, again, uh, doesn't cost them anything in the first instance. Um, I'll, I'll call it there because I'm cognizant of time. Uh, we've got a, sort of 10 minutes over. Um, we will hang around, um, but I do want to thank Emily, uh, Liam and Peter for their time today. We appreciate get you guys coming along. We will be, uh, this obviously was recorded. If you want to share it, Seamoss uh, will be getting this on our YouTube channel. Uh, so just type in Simo in YouTube and you'll find us. And this should be up uh, by this afternoon, depending on how slack Seamoss is with it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he's normally pretty quick. So it should be up by this afternoon at the latest tomorrow morning. So uh, once again, thank you to the panel. Thank you guys for coming along today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Simon.